all to come and participate in a program that NASA has organized, and we thank the First Armenian Church here in Belmont to make this space available uh, for our use, uh, since it was going to be an over crowd, overflow crowd for our facilities across the street. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Professor Richard Hobadisian with us again, uh, Mark Pomigonian, our Director of Academic Affairs, has dug out an old report almost 50 years ago was the first time Professor uh, Ovanesian spoke for a program Nasser had organized and this was in Pasadena, California. So we have a long history with Professor uh, Ovanesian and we welcome you again among our midst. Uh, uh, Professor Ovanesian has participated in the last few Nasser trips in historic Armenia, Giligia, uh, and uh, the eastern part of Tur current day Turkey. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, I'm sure he's going to refer to that trip as part of his talk. Uh, I, again, thank you for, I have to be careful with this mic. I again thank you for braving the weather and becoming members of the audience today. And uh, thank again uh, the First Armenian Church but Billy Hartunian wants to say a few words, please. It doesn't feel right really well. My own microphone gets me. Uh, no, thank you so much for being here. It's a real privilege for First Armenian Church to be able to partner with Nasser in an event like this. Um, the proximity makes it um, very, very special for us to be able to cooperate together and again welcome folks like you for such an important event. I mean, we here in Boston, I don't know if you're quite aware of it, not being a native uh, New Englander, the opportunities that we have here to be enriched in our understanding of our, our background, our heritage, our, our history, uh, really, are, in my opinion, are unparalleled. And for, for that opportunity, like this, as consistently as we have it, it truly is something it's very special for First Armenian Church to even be a part of it, at least in some small way. Um, so we really, we're grateful that you're here. And, and Richard, we, Uncle Richard, we just have to say that uh, we have to, uh, truly as a community, we really bless you. You have um, offered your life, your expertise um, for all of us and for those who have gone before us. And, and you tell stories that without you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know. And so thank you. Continue to do it as long as you possibly can. And you are always welcome. Thank you. I'd like to... Uh, Especially grateful to Badali Hartunian at the First Armenian Church because this weekend is a... They, they are marking a milestone and uh, they really went out of our way went out of their way to uh, accommodate having this event and uh, they, they've got their hands full uh, with, with, with an anniversary that is being celebrated tomorrow so we're, we're particularly grateful to them. Grateful too to uh, Boston University's Kenosian Chair in Modern Armenian History and Literature also co-sponsoring tonight's event and it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Simon Payasia, our, our friend and neighbor as well uh, although not across the street, uh, who holds the <laughs> who holds the Kenosian chair in, at Boston University, and I'd like to ask him to come on up and introduce Professor Hovanesian, uh, a, a job for which he is indeed well qualified. Thank you, Mark. Okay, put on your seatbelts and relax. I have a twenty-page introduction here. <laughs> just, just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, I would like to thank Nasser for this opportunity to introduce Professor Pomanesia. A special thanks to Mark Mamigonian for his excellent work at Nasser and his contributions to our many community life in general in the Boston area. Usually when Professor Hovanesia is a guest speaker, uh, the person introducing him will say something like, well, our guest speaker does not need an introduction. Uh, I'm not going to say that <laughs> because I want to introduce him and take as much time as possible to introduce him. I'm taking this opportunity to introduce Professor Ovalisson, of course. 
so, Professor Hovanesen is Professor Emeritus of Armenian and Near Eastern History at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, he received his BA and MA degrees from University of California, Berkeley, and his PhD from UCLA in 1966. He's been teaching at UCLA since 1962, and in 1987, he was appointed the first holder of the Armenian Educational Foundation Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History. For more than four decades, Professor Hovanesen has written, taught, lectured about the Armenian genocide, about Armenian history, about denial, and about the memory of the genocide. He is the author of and have a long list of uh, publications, but the most uh, famous ones uh, are Many on the Road to Independence. Uh, the four-volume uh, Republic of Armenia, uh, the Armenian Holocaust. He has edited, co-edited, and contributed to the Armenian image in history and literature, the Armenian genocide in perspective, the Armenian genocide history, politics, ethics, the Armenian people from ancient to, to modern times, and long list of other uh, publications. But more importantly for the past 10 years or so, uh, the series of international conferences held at UCLA on historic Armenian cities and provinces led to the publication of 11 volumes so far. And I think there are two or three more <laughs> in the making. Uh, the first one being Van Vasporagan, published in 2000. Uh, Daron Mush, Balish Pitlis, 2001. And the list goes on and on. And I had the privilege, the honor, to actually co-edit uh, with Professor Rovanistan two volumes, the uh, Armenian for Constantinople and uh, Armenian for Cilicia. And the most recent is, uh, if you've been to Nasser, uh, they have copies, Armenia Smyrna Izmir for the Aegean Communities uh, 2012. All this, in addition to <laughs> squeezing in two books, looking backward, moving forward, confronting the Armenian Genocide in 2003, and the Armenian Genocide Cultural and Ethical Legacies in 2007. Uh, I had the great pleasure, when I was at uh, UCLA, uh, finishing my uh, PhD, I had the great pleasure of working on some of those volumes, and co-edited, as I was saying, the two volumes. In the process of editing, and people who have actually worked with Professor Ovanesian, Ovanesian know exactly how he works in that stuff. They're not really surprised to hear. But he was just absolutely, he paid meticulous attention to every single detail, page after page, sentence after sentence after sentence. Let me give you an example. Uh, I can't remember which volume it was. So we were uh, in uh, Professor Ovanesian's office. <clears throat> and we were looking at sentence. Every single those two you know, volumes that we have, every single sentence uh, goes through huge examination. Uh, first by Professor Hovannesian, and then there is of course the the ultimate arbiter as to whether Professor Hovannesian has edited correctly or not, and that's Vatiter Hovannesian. <laughs> but <laughs> but there was this one time I remember this very vividly. Uh, there was a sentence. And both of us were standing there in front of the computer monitor, standing at it for probably five, ten minutes, trying to decide whether to insert a comma or not. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never forget that. Uh, in addition to his uh, publications, uh, Professor Hovannesen also has a long list of decades of civic activities and participation in scholarly community affairs. Uh, for example, he is uh, one of the founders of the Armenian Assembly of America and the Society for Armenian Studies and represented the state of California on the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education from 1970 to 1994. For many years, he has served on the board of directors of a number of organizations, including the Armenian National Institute, ANI, and the International Institute on the Holocaust and Genocide, among a long list of other uh, institutions, and several editorial boards, including the Journal for the Society for Armenian Studies, the Armenian Review, and Ararat. Uh, not surprisingly, Professor Hovannesen has received many honors for his scholarship and civic activities. He was honored by His Holiness Karakin II with the Medal of St. Mesrop Mashkot, 
for his contributions to Armenian studies. In 1990, he was the first social scientist in the diaspora to be elected to the Armenian Academy of Sciences. He has received honorary doctorates from Yerevan State University and Artsakh State University. Most recently, in March 2012, the Fresno County Board of Supervisors in California adopted resolution number 12079, commending Professor Hovannesian quote, for his more than 50 years of exemplary academic and personal life as a scholar, teacher, mentor, and friend. And that's actually exactly that's how I've known him. As a scholar, as a teacher, as a mentor, as a friend, actually a member of our family. Professor Roman Bessier. Simon, and, uh, and indeed uh, to both the First Church and to Nasser. Uh, for my returning here, I feel, uh, you know, this is my second home. I've known Boston. Um, I've probably been to Boston more than any other city in the world um, during all these years, uh, and so I have a very close bond with it. Uh, would you take the first? Most. Uh, most of us, uh, our, our grandparents, our parents, came from the eastern provinces of what is today Turkey. We came from Kharpert, and we uh, came from Sepastia, we came from Van, uh, areas uh, uh, to the east of the Euphrates River. Next one, please. Um, and um, sometimes forgetting that there were very active and vibrant Armenian communities, everyone in the Ottoman Empire um, that had their own institutions, their own schools, their own orphanages, uh, and uh, cultural, athletic, social, musical organizations. One of those communities, one of the most important of those communities, was Smyrna. And if you look at the map here, and if I can learn how to do this, uh, here is uh, Smyrna, or now known as Izmir, on, right on the western coast of the Aegean Sea. Here is the Aegean Sea, the ancient uh, region of Ionia, where uh, uh, so important in Hellenic uh, civilization. And uh, our homeland, the Armenian homeland, is way over here, and Cilicia, which is was like a second homeland is way down in this corner here, and Nasser trips have uh, recently gone to both these areas, as well as this year, uh, following a track from Ada Bazar and Bursa downward to uh, Izmir, Smyrna, uh, Bodrum, and along the coast into Cilicia. So this community uh, is uh, a, a very uh, significant one about which we don't have that much knowledge, probably, and that's why I want to focus on it, and it is the subject, as Dr. Piaslin pointed out, of the most recent publication in the series that I have published on historic Armenian cities and provinces. And it was only by coincidence, it wasn't by plan, because the conference on Smyrna was held uh, several years ago, that the volume appeared uh, this year uh, in, uh, in the summer, actually, uh, uh, we, and it coincides with the 90th anniversary of the burning of Smyrna. You can go back one. Um, and here you see the city of Smyrna, or Izmir, burning. Smyrna uh, was far more a Greek city than an Armenian city. The Armenian population was a, a very small segment of the total population of some 400,000 people, of whom at least half were Greek. Uh, there was a Jewish uh, quarter, an Armenian quarter, and then up on the hillside, uh, and sort of in very still primitive uh, development were the Turkish or Muslim quarter of the city. Uh, and it's um, here uh, that um, Armenians uh, played a very important role, or the Armenians of this community, played a very important role in their own history, in the Enlightenment, in the revival of Armenian learning, in the uh, uh, printing press, 
Um, uh, and so the small army and community and the community of Smyrna itself was, uh, if we can go to the map please, was, was uh, probably never more than in the city. There are different estimates that are given. Uh, some would say 20,000. Uh, to be uh, fair, probably around 10,000 Armenians lived here, along with the other towns and cities outlying from Smyrna in this area, uh, around Izmir, down to Aydin, uh, probably at 25,000 Armenians living in this area. And uh, I have noted in the introduction to the volume on Smyrna that the fact that I, I've usually taken in the whole province and not just a single city is justified by the uh, great importance of the city uh, uh, in uh, Armenian history. This uh, is the 90th anniversary of the destruction of Smyrna, the burning of the great fire of Smyrna, and the end to the Christian presence in the city. Today, it's one of the largest cities of Turkey, a beautiful city, still on the Aegean Sea, uh, a very impressive city, but no longer with any vestiges of its rich uh, Christian uh, and Armenian, Greco-Armenian, uh, heritage. Uh, next. Next. Uh, here you can see uh, the the outline of the uh, of, of the inner city, and this outline here is the outline of the Great Fire. So you see that most of the uh, city was burned. The Armenian quarter here is known as High Notes, High Notes, and they had several Armenian quarters, but here they were. Uh, well over 5,000 or 6,000 Armenians in one of the major quarters, very wealthy, very wealthy merchants. And then there are the Greek and Levantine. Levantine, that is a mixture of European and Asiatic peoples along the coastline, very rich and beautiful villas and homes. And then the Jewish quarter outside the line of the fire and the Turkish quarter outside the line of the fire here. Um, it was here that they had uh, very advanced uh, uh, stores and businesses, the famous Rue Franck, where they had department stores and European fashions and so forth. Next. Here's the ancient Agora, uh, the marketplace of Greco-Roman times. In the background, the mountain that backs up Smyrna, uh, Mount Bacchus. Next. Here you see a 19th century a picture of the city uh, uh, from the, with the Greek churches, numerous Greek Orthodox churches in the city. As a matter of fact, so much so that it was given the title of Gyalouf, the city, the, the infidel city, because the um, Christians were a majority in the city. Next. Again, you see uh, the uh, fortress, uh, the Kale above here and the boats at the harbor. Next. Next. Uh, once again, the quarters uh, of Smyrna, uh, the international European quarters, Greek quarter, and here are the uh, famous High Notes Armenian quarter uh, along uh, Moda Street and down to the other quarters. It was uh, Next, here is, you can see the, uh, the seafront villas, next. Here is Franco uh, Street, uh, French Street, where they, they weren't very wide, but very, very uh, rich uh, clothing from Europe, imported here uh, in high society. Next, Kramer Hotel, famous where everyone stayed, next. And the uh, State Theater, Armenian Theater, next. And here we find the uh, uh, panorama, and I'm going to stop here for a while, uh, the Greek Cathedral of St. Fotini. And here is the Armenian Cathedral. And you see it's not so far from the seacoast, and all this area you see here is the Armenian quarter of Hainauts, right in the heart of the city where, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, wealth of the Armenian community was uh, extraordinary. It ran into the hundreds of millions of dollars. They were involved in international trade, in produce, in 
uh, textiles and so forth. Uh, Ninety years ago today, if we were to go back 90 years today, we would find that we were at the end of uh, a great period of confusion with uh, well over 200,000 Christians uh, pushed to a very narrow cordon along the sea coast of maybe a hundred yards or, or so over an extent of about three miles from north to south uh, stuck uh, because the ruins of their quarter were behind them the sea was in front of them and Turkish nationalist inst installations were both north and south uh, by September 28th of 1922 the great fire had burned out uh, many of the young Greek men along with Armenians had been arrested and deported into the interior as hostages or prisoners of war and the civilian population was left to its own on the sea coast uh, with the proviso that they had to evacuate by September 30th or be uh, left to the tender mercies of the Turkish military and so in the last um, couple of weeks of September, just at this time, an international relief effort began with Greek ships allowed to come into the harbor, uh, with the European vessels allowed to come into the harbor to pick up all these thousands and thousands of Greek refugees and Christian refugees <clears throat> and to take them to the Greek islands which are, you know, just a few hours away or take them to Piraeus in, uh, in Greece, all the way to Greece where these poor people who had lived this very luxurious life in a coastal city were condemned to uh, living in the barren regions of northern Greece and the coastal cities for most of the rest of their lives never at all feeling at home and feeling very nostalgic for their uh, Izmir, for their Smyrna so it was a major relief effort, and thank God that most of them who had survived uh, were rescued and taken away. And the rest of them who had been taken away as prisoners of war or hostages had a very high mortality rate because they had to uh, work in the labor camps and so forth. And while uh, those who survived were ultimately exchanged in 1923 uh, after the or during the Lausanne Peace Treaty which revised the whole picture of the Near East uh, these people were uh, released and forcibly repatriated that is with the remaining Greek population of Asia Minor forcibly repatriated to Greece or taken to Greece in exchange for the Muslim population in Greece and so there was an exchange of about 1.2 million Christians from Turkey in exchange for about 400,000 Muslims from Greece and in that way the ethnic cleansing of Turkey uh, reached its height because prior to that prior to 1923 <coughs> the Armenians of Giligia of Cilicia of Marash, of Aintab, of Sis, of Hajan, uh, and, and other cities, uh, all the way to Urfa, had been forcibly expelled a second time. They had been expelled in 1915 and then through 1916. Many of them had come back after World War I to try to recreate their homes. Now in 1921 and 1922, because of the French-Turkish relations, because of the agreement that the French are making with the victorious Turkish nationalist armies of Mustafa Kemal, the Armenians are abandoned once again and go on an exodus down to Halebo, Alep, where today many of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are today facing the same kind of crisis that they did 
back in 1921-22. So the process of ethnic cleansing uh, in what was a multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural state that went on starting with the uh, Young Turk uh, Revolution, even before, with the 1890s massacres, with the Adana massacre of 1909, uh, and the Young Turk policies in World War I of destroying uh, or minimizing the Christian presence in what was seen to be the uh, Turkish homeland of, the, of Asia Minor. Um, this can be seen as the closing act of that, um, for the Armenians at least, calamity. Ironically, ironically, in 1915-1916, when most of the Armenians from throughout the Ottoman Empire uh, were being deported and killed, the Armenians of Smyrna felt very thankful because they had not been forced to leave. They had not been deported. Uh, some people would say because of a very pro-British governor, or Vali. Some would say because the local governor, uh, military leader was a German commander who absolutely forbade it. Some would say because it was an international trading center and the whole world could see what would be what was happening there. And whatever the reason was, the Armenian 10,000 or 12,000 Armenians of Smyrna felt themselves very fortunate in, in 1915. They even continued to have their schools, uh, their sports activities and so forth, while the rest of the Armenians were being destroyed everywhere. And having no clue, of course, that after a few years, their turn was to come. In fact, in 1918, when Ottoman Empire de was defeated, and Turkey was defeated, uh, they believed that their moment of uh, redemption had come, a moment of Armenian redemption had come. And uh, they were so excited in Smyrna in 1919, 1920, when Alexander Khatisyan, the president of the first Armenian Republic from Yerevan, visited Smyrna and there launched a campaign to gather uh, gold and jewelry for the struggling little Armenian Republic in the Caucasus, and then also when it was visited by the national heroic figure Antronik uh, Ozanyan, who came to Smyrna in that uh, period of time and was treated as a national hero. Um, as often, as often, Armenians are caught up in conflicts that they don't create, and yet they become a part of it. Just as today, the Armenians of Aleppo are a part of a conflict which they didn't create, which they don't want to be a part of, which they hoped wouldn't happen, uh, and yet there they are. And uh, in, in many ways, that was a part of the post-war picture in the Middle East because of the international politics that went on. The British Prime Minister Lloyd George supported um, the Greek Prime Minister Venizelos in his dream of creating a great Greek state, megalo, a megalo uh, Greek state, and allowed the Greek army to land in Smyrna in 1919 which caused a great deal of resentment among the Turks and it was a strong impetus to the rise of the Turkish nationalist movement that was led by Mustafa Kemal. In the following three years, the Greek army seemed to have the upper hand. As a matter of fact, at a time when Kemal uh, was labeled an outlaw by the Turkish government in Constantinople, in Istanbul, Kemal was in Ankara, first in Sivas and then in Ankara, uh, and was outlawed, and the Western powers considered him an outlaw. They allowed, for their own selfish reasons, the Greek army to advance, to destroy uh, the Kemalist movement. And it almost succeeded. It almost succeeded. It got up to within 60 miles of Ankara. 60 miles of Ankara. And that's a way in. And it was uh, sort of through heroic uh, Turkish uh, leadership 
of Kemal and his generals, they were able to stem the, Turk, uh, the, the Greek advance. And also within Greece at the time, there was a great civil strife between the pro-Venizelos and the pro-Royalists. Venizelos was a Republican. He didn't believe in monarchy. He didn't believe in the king. There was the king. Uh, and so in various elections, uh, the monarchists came back in in the middle of this war. It had a great demoralizing effect on the Greek army. And by the uh, month of August of 1922, after three years of Greek occupation, the Turks started their final advance. And as they did, they re retaliated against the uh, Greek towns and villages, much as uh, the, the Greeks had retaliated against them in previous years. And so we have a huge human tragedy of thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people fleeing from their homes in front of the, before the advance of the Turkish army. This included also the small Armenian communities that were scattered throughout Eskeshihir, Konya, uh, Kutaya, uh, onward, Aksari, Manisa, and so forth. They all now are Greek refugees, Armenian refugees, but primarily Greeks are pouring into Smyrna in the month of August of 1922, and yet still the people of Smyrna didn't believe that anything's going to happen to them because there was an Allied fleet right in the bay, right in front of them. There were British ships there. There were Greek ships there. There were American vessels there. There were French vessels there. So they felt that those vessels uh, with Allied, the presence of the great Allied uh, victors in World War I was a protection for what they found out um, on September 9th, when the uh, Kemalist armies marched in good order into Izmir, Smyrna, on uh, September 9th, 1922, um, and took over the city as the Greek army, the last remnants of the Greek army, were fleeing farther to the west to Cheshme near the uh, island of Chios, where they, from which they were going to get on, on Greek ships and try to get, uh, get out of there. Uh, what the, the uh, Armenians and Greeks didn't know at that time was that the Western Allied powers were going to let them down again, in many ways betray them once again. These are the very powers that had outlawed Mustafa Kemal. These are the very powers that wanted to punish Turkey at the Treaty of Sevra by creating a significant Armenian state in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire. And now we find that Lloyd George has changed his tune, Prime Minister, and especially the Americans who had collected millions and millions of dollars for the Armenian refugees and children and orphans. They created, as you know, the Near East Relief Organization that rescued so many thousands of women and children from Muslim households. They did wonderful, charitable work. But the Americans had in um, Istanbul, Constantinople, a high commissioner whose name was Mark Bristol, Vice Admiral Mark Bristol who detested the minorities of the Ottoman Empire, you know, and said, take, uh, take Greeks, take Armenians, and take Jews, and shake them up in a bag, and they all come out the same thing, all trustworthy, all trusted. The Turks are not so great, he said, but they are much better uh, than they. And Mark Bristol was, um, what we could say, the, the best form of selfish American capitalist who wanted to be sure that the Americans had access to the future Near East, uh, was opposed to dividing up the Ottoman Empire in any way, and who had great influence by sending report after report after report, and even doctoring the reports. For example, you know, when the times of uh, the genocide, Armenian genocide, Morgenthau, the Armenian, the, the American ambassador, was sending many, many messages from his consuls and missionaries to Washington, D.C. Imagine Morgenthau taking those same 
documents and doctoring them. That is, uh, cutting out lines and putting in lines and uh, changing the whole complex. And so, the Turkish Nationals had a great friend in Mark Bristol, and he played the card of saying, look, the United States has not declared, ever declared war on Turkey. Uh, it's true that diplomatic relations were severed by Turkey uh, once Turkey entered the war on the side of Germany, or, or when once Germany declared war on the United States in 1917, but there was never a formal declaration of war. Uh, we are technically a neutral power. So when it now comes down, so now when it comes down to um, relations between the Greeks and the Turks, we must maintain that neutrality. And even when it comes down to giving the refugees, the Christian refugees, a safe haven on American vessels, that would be considered to be not neutral. So let them swim out to the ships, but don't let them on board. Do everything you can do to prevent them from getting on board. Use fire, uh, water hoses, do whatever you need to do to dump them back into the sea. That's American neutrality, as seen by Mark Bristol in 1919, at the time of the Great Fire. The Great Fire began uh, four days after the arrival of the Turkish army. Four days after it began, and uh, it started in many parts of the Armenian quarter. It was an intentional act of arson. It was not accidents. Many cities have had fires, and Smyrna had had, had its share of, of, of fires as well in the past, but this is one that was organized, planned, and set in many parts, so that the Armenians first rushed to their church, cathedral of St. Stephanos, St. Stephen, so as many as 5,000 Armenians there. And then when, even before the fire got to them, there were grenades thrown into the courtyard, they fled out of the, the church toward the sea, joining the masses of others. The fire was so hot, I mean, imagine the entire city burning and the heat of the flames and the smoke choking people and burning people uh, throughout the city. And then imagine taking half of the city of Boston and putting them onto the, uh, the piers in Boston and the, everyone pushing everyone else in great uh, terror. The people being pushed into the sea, being trampled upon, uh, at all stages of their ages and life. And so many of them are going to jump into the water as the flames burn and they choke. Uh, jump into the water, uh, uh, starting, this fire lasted from the 13th to the 15th of September, three days. And it was a magnificent, as one of the Americans said, it was, it was horrifyingly magnificent when you see a whole city burning. Uh, at night with the glowing and, and flames. Uh, and when these people initially went out to the Allied vessels to be rescued, they were denied haven and were thrown back into the sea. That was a change, but the first day at least was that way. Uh, there have been a number of uh, descriptions by American and British military personnel on the spot at the time. And I'd like to read just uh, a couple of them. Uh, and I'd like a sailor, an uh, American sailor on the USS Maine wrote, the carnage and cruelty to the Greek civilians was indescribable. Hundreds of Greek civilians as well as troops hanging over the dock, waterside, and the Turkish soldiers coming along and deliberately severing the victims' arms, resulting in hundreds of bodies falling to their deaths 
in the sea. Ward Price, from aboard the British SS Ironsides, which was the flagship, wrote, when the screams from the distant quayside grew too loud to be ignored, the captain ordered the ship's band to strike up tunes. Other ships followed. An American sailor, Marine, Duncan Wallace says, one of the strangest experiences that night was to hear the band playing while the town was burning. And so, in order to avoid and not feel so guilty, perhaps, the American bands and the British bands are playing uh, aboard ship as the city is burning, and thousands of people are in the water dying. As I say, fortunately, after the first day, the Allied uh, vessels changed their policy. I don't not study this, I'm sure people here probably have done so and give us the answer, but there was a reversal, reversal on the orders and they began taking these uh, victims uh, uh, on board. But, you know, after a day or so, they had taken on 5,000 refugees out of 200,000 refugees. So you can imagine the great chaos and confusion that continued there uh, until uh, the agreement was made with Mustafa Kemal to allow these people, not to harm these people, and to give the Greek government 30 days or two weeks actually to evacuate them. And that's when the Allied vessels uh, did participate in this massive human transportation out of it and help to close the final page on the history of Christian Asia Minor and Christian Smyrna. I want um, to focus a little bit more on Armenian Smyrna, since that's the topic of the book that I just edited and the focus of the series that I'm doing of Armenian communities. Uh, Armenians have been there for several hundred years. Uh, they're, they're not new. They didn't come to Smyrna in the 1890s. The, uh, the, uh, as, you say, as I said, here you see and this major uh, Armenian quarter in the heart of the city of Hainots. And Hainots, for those of you who don't uh, understand Armenian, means a, a place where Armenians are, a place of Armenian concentration, coming from the word Hai, and Hainots is a place. So an Armenian place uh, is uh, here in the center. Next. Uh, this is the Catholic Church of uh, Polycarp. Uh, first uh, bishop, Christian bishop of uh, Smyrna was Polycarp who was martyred and so his church, Catholic Church, is there next. And the Greek Orthodox Church of Fotini, next. And here we are again to the Armenian Quarter. Look at it. Uh, red, tile, red tile buildings everywhere. Uh, very well built, uh, constructed. Uh, you see in the background something that looks like a forest or woods. That's where uh, the Armenian Protestant Church is. That's where the Armenian School for Girls, uh, Ripsinyans School is uh, down there. And closer, closer to us by the church to the right is the Mefsropian School for Boys. And to the left, uh, a couple of blocks, is Suprikor Lusavorich National Hospital. The Armenians had their own hospital, their national hospital, all in this region of of high notes. The Armenians' uh, presence uh, is uh, attested. Uh, in 1261, it was probably there before, but at least in 1261, by a treaty between the Byzantine Emperor and the Genoese, uh, where Armenians are mentioned being in Smyrna as uh, traitors. And uh, you, again, the, uh, most of you know Armenian history. You know that in 1375, the last Armenian kingdom in Gilikia uh, fell to the Mamluks in 1375, and thousands of Armenians left Cilicia, fled from Cilicia to the Greek islands, and many of them came to uh, the region of Smyrna. Many thousands more of Armenians came from all over in the subsequent centuries, 
from Hartberg, from uh, Sebastia and other areas. For example, on the outskirts of Smyrna is a town of Manisa. And here they had two Armenian churches and schools, and the Ar Armenian population of Manisa spoke the Harper dialect uh, right down into the 19th, early 20th century, because they had come from Harper and they still spoke that dialect that they had come with so many uh, generations uh, before that. Uh, and then in the 16th and 17th century, in the plain of Ara, where Yerevan is today, and where um, Julfa is today, there was incessant warfare between the Turks and the Persians. You've heard of Shah Abbas, who took thousands of Armenians from the plain of Ararat and from Julfa down to his capital uh, in Isfahan, and uh, they created the new city of New Julfa there, which still exists as a major trading center it became. At the same time, many thousands of Armenians, Eastern Armenian speakers, came to the West, and some of these settled in Smyrna. So there's different groups of people, different waves have come to Smyrna over, uh, over the centuries. What's um, coastal cities, as you probably know, uh, are freer uh, and have more opportunity for people. And that's why not only here, but on the Black Sea, uh, Trabzon and Ordu, Samson, and on. The Armenian communities area of these areas are far more enlightened than those of the historic homeland. They've, they've started their schools much earlier. They have schools for women and girls much earlier. They engaged in trade. They live a much more prosperous life because they're on the seas. And so this is a story also of Smyrna. The Smyrnans were right sitting perfectly to be a part of the international trade network from uh, the Indian Ocean, from uh, Julfa, New Julfa, uh, toward the Italian city-states, Livorno, and Genoa, and Venice, and Amsterdam beyond, and uh, Manchester, especially beyond that in England, all manufacturing cities. And they were the major purveyors of silk. And when the silk trade went down, they were, be they were the exporters of cotton, of dried fruit, of textiles, of carpets, all of these items going in, into Europe and, um, as I say, became one of the wealthiest uh, communities per capita, if not the wealthiest community uh, in the world uh, as a result of this great prosperity that they had. Uh, beginning in uh, the 18th century already, in uh, 1759, how many years ago is that? Almost. You know, we're going on the third, third hundred years. They already had a praying press uh, working under uh, Matias de Margos. And uh, then subsequently, when the Mesropian School for Boys was opened they, in 1840, they uh, created their own printing press. And down through, um, uh, down through the uh, decades, Smyrna becomes and remains a major publishing and printing center. Here the uh, Armenian newspaper, one of the first Armenian newspaper, um, is, uh, appears in 1840, Arshalus Araradya. And this newspaper is, is, is followed by a whole series of, uh, of other newspapers published by Armenians. It becomes, and Barbara McGarrian is here, one of the authors uh, in this volume on Armenian Smyrna, which I hope you will take, uh, she demonstrates uh, uh, Armenian Smyrna as a major publishing center for uh, the American missionaries. It's, they use Smyrna as a, to, to publish, and she shows how, what they published, who they were, and uh, how important it was, especially in Armeno Turkish, which is, as you probably know, uh, a Turkish language, but in Armenian letters, because many people uh, couldn't speak Armenian, although they said their prayers in Armenian. They spoke Turkish and they, could, they wrote in Armenian letters. And they wrote in Armenian letters. And so uh, they propagated a great deal of literature in, in that way. Uh, let me, I don't want to take too much time. Let's, let's go on. Uh, here, here you see um, the, the St. Stephen uh, Armenian Church. And if you look up a couple of blocks, you'll see Holy Illuminators Hospital. 
And if you come down just below uh, the um, St. Saint, Saint Stephen's Church, you see the Mesropian School. And as you go way up to the right, toward the where those trees were that I showed you, the Armenian Machitaris, Machitarian School at a very large um, Armenian Catholic school here. And farther to the right, the Armenian Protestant Meeting House and the St. Ripsime School for Girls. This was all in the Armenian Quarter, uh, which was in the heart of the city. And today is a really beautiful uh, high-rise part of Izmir with, you know, Hilton Hotels and other uh, very major uh, structures. None of, nothing Armenian can be found any longer here. Next. Here's one of the streets. You see the cross down there leading to one of the entrances to St. Stephen. Next. And here is Sir Stepanos. Next. Uh, a traditional fat Armenian priest of the uh, early, early 18th century. Next. Here we will see the courtyard of Stepanos. Next. Uh, and in this chapter, in this volume, uh, you have a professor here at Tufts whose name is Christina Maranchi. She's done this chapter on uh, the um, Armenian architecture, and especially Srub Stepanos Church of uh, Smyrna. And here is she uh, has some illustrations showing you the interior. Look at how high it is, uh, the vaults. Next. The altar. Next. And here right next door is the Mesropian School. The Mesropian School is really an institution uh, because generations of Armenian intellectuals got their basic education here. Before they went on to Europe, before they went on to Constantinople, uh, before they started their careers, they all went to the Mesropian School. It had its own printing press, its own uh, a very, very major library, multilingual library. It was a very advanced institution. And uh, this is sort of the home base. Uh, you know, those of us who know Caucasian Armenian history, we talk about the um, Lazarian Jemaran of, of Moscow, or the Kevorkian Jemaran of uh, Echmiadzin, or the Nersesian Jemaran of Tiflis. And in many ways, this was the same kind of institution uh, in this area. Next. Uh, look at the students, quite different looking from today's, my, my students today who all come as men and women in shorts and uh, whatever else, torn, torn shirts and so forth. And, uh, look, look at the students uh, of uh, 19, uh, early 1900s students and faculty of the Mestropian School. Next. And here is the graduating class and the science class. Everyone with uh, ties and Jackets. They went to school in this way. Next. And here is the uh, Mesropian School athletic team. Uh, athletics were very big. And by the way, you probably know that athletics are a very important avenue of national identity and um, enhancing nationalist feeling in all groups, in all nationalities. And that became very strong uh, here in the athletic movement. Next. Can you see all right? Yeah. Uh, here we have now, look at the same style, Nguyen Um Here on the top, of course, you see the, uh, the mountain back. This is the, the girls' school, Haripsian, school. That was, that was organized in the latter part of the 19th century, but followed the same kind of uh, uh, curriculum and uh, mission as the uh, Mesropia. Next. Here you see the, the girls uh, of the class with their two teachers in the center and uh, the uh, staff, again, looking very much like uh, English or American mums uh, in a, a, remember, in a very traditional Islamic society where their Turkish neighbors were still covered with the veil and uh, next. Here, uh, graduating class, and this poor woman, who was the head mistress, uh, unfortunately was in Sebastia in 1915, and was taken out and killed with all the rest of the Sebastians in 1915. Next. This is the Catholic, uh, Makitarian, Tebrots, and you can see 
once again, uh, different classes, uh, upperclassmen at the bottom. You see the Vartabits, the priests in the middle with their secular teachers uh, on their side. Uh, a very active Catholic community uh, in this city. Next. Uh, scouts, uh, I'm sorry, athletic teams. One's the Vaspuragan, and the other one is Arara. Next. And here are the Armenian Boy Scouts. And uh, this is, um, this is even after 1918, uh, I believe. I think that's the, I, I think it's the Armenian tricolor. Uh, the red, blue, and orange behind them, and it's not that, then it's the French, but I think it's the Armenian one. And, but look at uh, the scouting movement, burgeoning at the time. Next. This is the American uh, International Institute uh, <coughs> College, where most of the student body were Greeks and Armenians. Uh, it's, it was outside the city, about two miles, in an area known as Paradiso or Paradise. Next. And here you see a student conference taking place here in 1915. And as I said, ironically, these Armenian students were having a like a, a student conference at a time when the rest of their people in the interior are being destroyed. Next. Uh, intellectual center, I'm not going to go into detail. The first one is Stepan Voskanyan, uh, Grigor Chilengirian, Matheus uh, Mamurian, and one of the um, Dedean brothers. These uh, Dedeans uh, had one of the uh, most active, productive, presses in Smyrna, published many, many uh, books, but they were also literary critics. There were three or four Dedean brothers. Uh, Voskan, uh, and all of these other gentlemen, uh, Voskan or Voskanian, Chilingirian, um, uh, Mamurian, all published their own newspapers. They all wrote their original Armenian works, and they all were magnificent, outstanding translators of European classics into Armenian. At the time there was sort of a, a craving for things European, including European literature, and translated European literature became the rage. And so they translated from all the languages, I mean from uh, Ivanhoe, from Ivanhoe to all of Shakespeare, and from all of Shakespeare to uh, Maubasson, Victor Hugo, and from there to Tolstoy, uh, and you know, across uh, uh, Goethe. So they're translating from Russian, from German, from French, from English, into readable Armenian. And that made them champions of the modern vernacular Armenian language, Western Armenian, literary language. That made them champions. You know, there was a great struggle in the 19th century between intellectuals who believed in the purity of the language and needed to continue to use the beautiful Armenian Grabar, the language of the Bible, Armenian Bible, the language of classical times. And those who said, no, we need to become up, you know, we need to get with it. And the times have changed. We need to pre we need a utilitarian, a useful language where we can talk and preach and teach our people. And that struggle went on for some decades. And Smyrna, with Constantinople, these two cities were where these battles took place. And, uh, and Smyrna was sort of the unremembered uh, younger brother or sister of Constantinople. And yet, uh, again, when you look at the numbers of Armenians there and the work that they did, they're far more important, if I may dare to say that, than, uh, than Constantinople. All of these people were um, social critics. They criticized the uh, backwardness within the Armenian community. They tended to be anti-clerical. They uh, were all anti-monarchical. They opposed oppression. They opposed um, monarchic regimes. They looked toward a future Republican, democratic style of government. They, didn't, they were not revolutionaries, but they were evolutionaries. And, of course, just being an evolutionary would get you in trouble in the time of Abdul Hamid, as you well know. So they all were also subjected to various forms of, of censorship. Uh, but they, they were teachers, scholars, writers, preachers, moralists, 
philosophers all uh, in one, and it's not fair to uh, put them all into one basket, but I don't have time to talk about each one individually. Next. And here you see what, uh, fig manufacturing or, or, or production. Dried figs. Well, the Armenian had a near monopoly on the preparation of dried figs. And anyway, you know, we grew up in Fresno. Uh, those of you uh, in, in, where, where all the very nice homes are, these used to be known as fig gardens. We call them fig gardens. And they were all Smyrna figs because the Armenians had imported the Smyrna fig from Izmir and planted it in the San Joaquin Valley of California where it thrived as well. And you can see the uh, preparation uh, of, uh, uh, of dried figs for export. Next. And here's another. Here it says, uh, Janik El Masian's Fig Factory. Next. Uh, carpeting. These are uh, Armenian girls who are weaving. Um, carpets, uh, which is another important export. Next. Now this is right here from the Armenian Library and Museum. Um, Christina Maranchi uh, has gone to the library and, and these are uh, pieces from Izmir, from Smyrna. Uh, little rugs, uh, pillow covers. Next. And you, you look at the lace doilies and the lace uh, rich lace to the, uh, I think I'm missing something, but nonetheless, uh, next. Uh, so so th uh, that's the kind of, um, uh, of uh, produ uh, produce uh, that uh, we had in hand manufacturing. Now, the, if you look at Izmir, um, here, around it are a, a number of other uh, towns where there are Armenian communities. Menemen, Manisa, where I said there were two churches and many Kharpertsis, one upper and lower quarters, you know, it's on a hillside. Uh, up here is, uh, uh, i trying to think of it as a Kirkachach. And here, uh, this is uh, Kasaba, you know, the Kasaba melon, have you heard of that? And this is the birthplace for those of you who remember the name of Alec Manuyan who was the international president of the AGBU, Alec Manugian, you know, you know that name? Yeah. Uh, this is his birthplace, uh, near, just out on the outskirts of Smyrna. Udemish, again, you know, I, I had heard of some of these names, and before I started, before I traveled here uh, a couple of years ago, I didn't know about Udemish, only to learn later, it is a very thriving Armenian community, schools, church, choral groups, Tire, Tire, Aiden, all of these areas had Armenian communities. You see, this is a whole arc. And when we talk about people being Izmirci, it includes these people. And they uh, constitute a part of the 25,000 or so Armenians, uh, conservatively, that were here. And again, you can see the harbor here. You see how, uh, what a perfect harbor uh, or gulf this is. The, the ships come all the way down here, uh, where there's relative calm and are able to get right here where the port is. And it was right along here that those refugees were stranded, right here, were taken, and the ships were right there, right next door, a hundred yards away, and were finally were allowed to get out, whereas the Greek army retreated this way to Cheshme, and here is the island of Chios right next door. These are the Greek islands all, all along the way there. Next. Uh, here, like outside of High Notes, uh, an uh, example of an Armenian mansion in Burro, which is right to the north of Izmir. Next. Uh, this is a suburb known as Karaha, Karatash. And here is the Armenian church. You see it? Subkarabet is right on the top of a hill in the sub a suburb there. Next. And the same town, the Vartanian School, which is now a city museum. Next. The school again, next. And here are students from the Vartanian school uh, 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 in uh, Karatash. So it's not, as a, you know, I, what, what I want to point out is that it's really, uh, education is developed throughout the communities, even the small communities, and co-educational, co-educational. Next. Uh, Manisa, where there uh, was a significant Armenian community and 
one uh, Armenian region on the hill and one down in the, in the flats. Next, Kirkachach, which is to the north of Manisa. Uh, many of the, it's, it's a beautiful area, backed by mountains. Next. Here is the Armenian church of Kirkachach, you can't find it anymore, of, of Surpas Vazazin, Holy Mary, next, and the Armenian school of Kirkachach, next. This is Idinish, uh, to the south, it's about, uh, I don't know, probably 60 miles or so, uh, 50, 60 miles from Izmir, next. See the, uh, this is a choir, and here is a interesting, like we have now, two teams, the Armenian team from Edenish and the Armenian team from Smyrna. They've traveled all that way, it's quite some distance in those days, going 50, 60 miles for a football match. Next. And next. Let's go back. All right, let's just stay there. Um, who was responsible? Let me see what my time is. Uh, I'll be finished in 10 minutes. It's really, really hard to figure out. It's really hard. <laughs> uh, who was responsible for this great fire? Uh, for those of us who study history, know there are a lot of controversies. And it depends on you can be at the same place and see the same thing and come away with different interpretations. The Turkish state narrative, supported by some Americans, is that the Armenians set fire to their own city. Uh, they didn't want it to fall into the hands of the Turks, and therefore they chose to burn their city rather than to give it up. That point of view uh, is supported by the principle of the American school that is in Paradiso, which is two or three miles away, even though he himself confessed that he wasn't there, and he also confessed to the fact that he would have been killed by Turkish irregulars if a Turkish officer had not intervened to save his life, but still he makes the very logical argument. Why would a victorious army why would the Turkish army burn a city which it had just captured, which had so much wealth in it? And I was sent um, an article about the, or just the Armenian wealth that was lost in this fire, and it comes to something like $120 million, just the Armenian wealth. Um, so they say it doesn't make sense for uh, an army that has won the war, which has all this loot in front of it to burn it. Uh, that point of view, as I say, is supported by a couple of American officials. It's that one that's supported by Admiral Mark Bristol, who is in, uh, the high com American High Commissioner, and, and a, a couple of others. Uh, on the other hand, you have um, you have officials, uh, again, American officials, who say exactly the opposite. So it's, it's really uh, still, I would say, um, a controversy. Uh, I, the, American, the American consul on the spot uh, was uh, George Horton. George Horton came home and uh, wrote a book uh, a very anti, sort of prejudice book against the Turks, uh, in which he called him the Blight of Asia, in which he describes the fire from a first-hand point of view, because the American consulate, they had an American consulate right on the sea coast, was right in the midst of the fire. And um, according to George Horton, it says, um, at, at first, civilian Turks Natives of the towns were the chief offenders. I myself saw such civilians armed with shotguns watching the windows of Christian houses ready to shoot at any head that might appear. This was followed, he wrote, then he follows, 
The Turks were now making a thorough and systematic job of killing Armenian men. The squads of soldiers, which had given the inhabitants a certain amount of comfort at first, were chiefly engaged in hunting down and killing Armenians. And he concludes, the torch was applied to that ill-fated city, and it was all systematic burned by the soldiers of Mustafa Kemal in order to exterminate Christianity in Asia Minor and render it impossible for the Christians to return. And I have here uh, other evidences, and I'm not going to read them, by uh, the director of the American Collegiate Institute for Girls, um, Minnie Mills, who again says she saw with her own eyes Armenian office, uh, uh, Turkish officers and soldiers learning of, uh, burning the fire. And of course, if you are taking the Turkish state narrative, you explain that, that the Armenians uh, were deceptive. They wore Turkish uniforms as they set the fire to make it look like it was the Turks and, and not they. Um, the Turkish evidence is um, also, recent Turkish evidence, is I think very, very helpful in understanding this. And I have several Turkish authors who um, analyze the destruction and who burned it. But probably the most effective is a Turkish woman, Professor at Boğaziçi University, that used to be known as Robert College in Istanbul, whose name is Bire uh, Kuro Kurla. And in her article, Forgetting the Smyrna Fire, she uh, analyzed the material, uh, maternal, I'm sorry, the material and symbolic reconfiguration of urban spaces and population structure in the process of transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish nation state. She writes, <clears throat> Symbolically, the Great Fire was an act of punishment, a destruction aiming to purify, to, chast to chastise this Gyabur infidel city. At the same time, the destruction of the city through fire was an act of creation, an attempt to build places of counter-memory, opening up a terrain upon which the new nation's image, its Muslim and Turkish identity, could be carved and its cosmopolitanism nationalized. She includes the testimony of a Turkish veteran who brags about killing all the Gyabur's. It's interesting, he talks about killing all the Gyabur's and Armenians. And I suppose for them, the word Gyabur was uh, limited to Greeks. And so when you say Gyabur and Armenians, it, it means Greeks and Armenians, and goes on to appraise them. But then I just want to read her conclusion. The fire marks the moment when the spatial and temporal con uh, continuity of Smyrna Izmir was broken, a moment of discontinuity. The social and spatial geography of the Ottoman Empire had to be remade and remapped for the construction of Turkish nationalism and the formation of a Turkish nation state. And she goes on. Now, I forgot at the beginning of this hour, and I'm not just remembered, that I have a three minute video of the actual burning of it. Uh, and I want you to see it. It's accompanied by a very dirgeful Greek uh, so, uh, song uh, as a Greek singer remembers the destruction of Smyrna 90 years ago that I would like us to see now. You will see at the beginning of this glimpses of the prosperity of, as well. Need sound?
just going to show you a um, concluding few slides. Um, I thought it was quite effective to see the live burning of the city and imagine that massive humanity, these proud people who had been made into people, you know, trying to grasp a loaf of bread uh, from uh, the Americans and others who were there. Here's the city. Uh, again, look, let's go back there. Uh, just look at the map. You can see the uh, outline of the fire once again, like this. And here, right in the heart of it, is uh, the Armenian quarter. Next. 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 This was the, Ar the Greek uh, archbishop who was tortured to death once the, uh, at the time by the Turkish mob. Next. You see the uh, destruction of the city afterwards. Next. Next. The American Consul, I'm sorry, the Sports Club. Here was the uh, Sports Club of Izmir before, and here it is after the fire. Next. The American Consulate, before the fire and after the fire. Next. And the city burned down. It remained like this, burned down for about 20 years. And then they started a major plan of rebuilding. And it became uh, a well-planned out city. All the old streets are gone. And new boulevards are laid out uh, and so forth. The, where the Armenian quarter was, there's still a park there. And there's an international fair ground right next to the Armenian quarter of Izmir. Next. Here you see the modern city from the Armenian Quarter. Hotel, the bay, and the suburbs. Next. Next. And as I say, here we are looking from the uh, park and woods where the Armenian Quarter had been until 1922. And not to leave on an entirely negative note this evening, uh, I searched everywhere and we searched everywhere for army and vestiges here. All we could find were a couple of houses with high balconies that come from that period. But about a half hour north of uh, Izmir is a town known as Menemen. And I was able to, or we discovered here a church known as Subsakis, which is still standing. And the good news is that the city council has declared it a historical monument for preservation. And we hope that might be, you know, at least a gesture of goodwill that will spread. Let's go to the next one. Here is the uh, Armenian Church of Sub Sarkis in, in Menemen, where some of us visited uh, this past uh, June. Next. And here you see some of you will recognize people. Uh, on the interior, it's really uh, unmanaged and unkept, unkempt, but as a uh, historical monument, hopefully, it will serve as a sample of things that might be done in the future. Thank you very much. Refreshments for any brave souls who want to cross back across the street uh, through the rain. Don't get hit by a car, please. Uh, so, three questions. Question one, question two, and question three. I see two hands. Uh, give up arms to the Camelotta tract that uh, 
Yeah, the question, the question is number of people, victims, and why, what about that allied policy in the first instance? The number of figure who died was about 100,000 uh, in uh, minimally. Another 100,000 were taken as prisoners, and 200,000 were taken aboard ship. Of the, of the numbers of Arvians who died, probably five to 7,000 uh, were burned uh, in their quarter. Uh, again, most of them were able to uh, end up in Piraeus in Greece or, or somewhere, anywhere around the world. And as far as allies, it was a time when the allies were recalibrating. They had supported uh, the Sultan's government. They, w they wanted to punish uh, Turkey. They had been opposed to Mustafa Kemal, but they saw now that they had the upper hand. They had taken over all of Asia Minor. The French had already made a deal with him to give up Cilicia, Giligia, and were, had abandoned there, uh, the area. And so they were looking to make, uh, you know, to make a deal. And this was a part of making a deal, which came true a few months later at the Treaty of Lozano. Did I mention that the book was on sale? <laughs> yeah, you can't leave unless you have one at the door. We're checking. All right. Okay. Thank you. Oh, last question. Constantinople during the Cyprus problems. And 55. Yeah, yeah, 1950. And they burned it. And they, it was in the region. Yeah, so, so the gentleman is saying that he's, he's uh, seen it with his own eyes. I, I, I suffered. I yeah, he suffered his, his, in many, and uh, this kind of uh, activity is taking place in many places where uh, this idea of that you don't burn places if it's, it's yours is silly because. There's this anger and retribution, etc., that takes place uh, over that. So, but thank you. But, but it was uh, instigated by the British government. Yeah, uh, it's supported by the British. As and well. Today, just before coming here, I was looking in my, on the books of my library. And I found the book, The Question of the American Mandate over Armenia. I just saw in the library the video of the library. On the American Mandate. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, the book was written by Anthony Kenderian. He wrote his, uh, sorry for the time, he wrote his uh, history, master's degree from uh, in right. okay. University, and he wrote this book. Wait, thank you very much about the mandate. The problem is that we can't hear you in the back, and I think that the, uh, the gentleman is uh, uh, feeling very deeply about uh, losses, personal and, and collective, and he uh, points a finger of blame once again at the Western powers for uh, participating in this and points also to 1955 where I was there in Istanbul when there were ri anti-Greek riots in the city and much of the Greek businesses along with Armenian and Jewish businesses were attacked by a mob and the traditional kind of mobs that are supposed to be spontaneous but which we find out later are organized by the state. Alright, one final question. No, that's it? Okay. Good time. I like the three questions.